Hello, everybody. We're so happy to have you here this evening. We are presenting this informational session uh, about a referendum that's going to appear on the ballot for residents of Vernon Township in Lake County, Illinois. But our speakers will also be talking about 708 mental health boards and how they could be adopted in other communities and other by other governmental bodies. So I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Lori Gwinawi, who is the specialist for uh, mental health for the League of Women Voters of Illinois. And her co-presenter is Joanne Johnson, who is the chairman of the Vernon Township uh, Referendum Campaign Committee and is also a member of the Board of Trustees of Buffalo Grove. So I will start the program right now. I mean, I will uh, let them start the program right now. Hi, Laurie. Hi, Joanne. Hi. Hi. Nice to be here. Let me it's share great. my screen. Do you want me to share, Joanne, or would you? I've got it right here. OK, good. Um, let's see. sharing oh, I have all these uh, warnings about um, recordings <laughs> so Lori maybe you should share yours because okay. it wants me to go into my system preferences and we don't have time for that yeah yeah that's fine I've done this a few times I had a little more experience at it. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us. I just realized here on this front slide, it says Lyle Township. This is for Vernon Township. Apologize for that. Um, the, we There are, as we were mentioning earlier, there are eight communities where this is gonna be on the ballot. So Vernon Township, Wheeling Township, Schomburg, Naperville, uh, Lyle, Addison, Winfield, and then also Will County. So all the other sevens are by township. Uh, I am working on this specifically for Wheeling Township. And as Rosemary mentioned, I'm the mental health specialist for the League of Women Voters Illinois. So trying to help out everyone else as well. I became aware of, of 708 Community Mental Health Boards through my volunteer work with NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness. I joined NAMI back in 2012 when my youngest son was diagnosed with schizophrenia. That diagnosis changed his life as it changed our whole family's life. So through my work with NAMI, when we heard about the 708 Community Mental Health Boards, we thought we, we really need to have one of these in our communities. And that's why we wanna to talk to you about what it is. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the needs in the community and then also what a board is, what it can do, and ho hopefully why your community should have one. So this slide is actually from NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Two things that I really think that it demonstrates. One is that Mental illness is truly non-discriminatory. It affects all people, any age, any race. It really doesn't care who you are, what your background is. And then also the statistics on, on how many people get treatment. And this is actually an older slide. And I bet these numbers have actually gone down because right now it is very difficult to find both therapists and psychiatrists. So what is a 708 board? Right now, there are about 90 of these types of boards across Illinois. They're unique to Illinois. They're covered underneath an Illinois state statute, the Illinois Community Mental Health Act. They, are, they can be created by any unit of government. There's actually several of these in the city of Chicago. And I'm not quite sure what the unit of government is, but there's there's... I believe four right now in Chicago. They're all volunteer members. They have to be seven to nine members. 
since we're discussing townships, we're going to talk about this as if it were a township creating one of these. Once it's established, once it passes a vote, because this is a referendum that's voted on by the people, then the uh, members would be appointed by the township her supervisor. One essential point of this is they're not service providers. They can fund programs, they can fund agencies, they can fund organizations, um, but they do not provide actual services. So the first thing they're required to do, the board has to be established within 60 days of the referendum passing. And then the next thing that they're going to do, they're required to do is an evaluation, some type of survey of what that community's needs are. So when people say, we get this question a lot, tell me what this board is going to do. Will it do this? Will it do that? We can't say with absolute certainty because it really depends on what this survey says. So every community is unique. Every community's needs are going to be a little bit different, but it has to serve uh, three populations, mental health, substance use, and developmental and intellectual disabilities. Lori, I'd like to add something to that. Um, one of the top two questions I get when I talk to people is, tell me specifically what you're going to do. And of course, we can't answer that because they'll be doing the community survey and the needs assessment after they're established. Um, and so the beauty of a 708 board is that it's tax local, it stays local. So it, it will address the specific needs of that township, that community. So we can tell you what other townships have done, <laughs> but that might not be what we need in Vernon Township or Wheeling Township. That's very true. So the, another big part of what they're going to do then, based on that survey, is they're going to strategize. They're going to plan. They are required to do uh, a one-year plan, and I believe it's a three-year plan. It might be a five-year plan, but I think it's a three-year plan. It's all spelled out in that state um, statute. And then they allocate the funding. Different boards do it different ways, but there's, you know, it, it wouldn't have to be something that would have to be recreated. Look at, see what other boards have done and Pick the method that works best for, for your community. The two big things that we tell people that it absolutely will do is to reduce the long wait lists and eliminate gaps in services. Is it going to eliminate all the gaps? I mean, obviously not. There's a lot of needs. Um, but th those are the two big things. In talking with service providers in our area, and many of the service providers for Wheeling Township and Vernon are the same. Um, to get a therapist right now, the wait is somewhere between six to nine months, and a psychiatrist is even longer. And so one of the things that they could do is, you know, perhaps they could help to hire another therapist, or they could help um, maybe reduce the gap in what people are getting paid. Someplace like Kenneth Young Center that does a lot of um, work with Medi Medicaid and Medicare patients, they just don't get paid as much as some, as much they don't get paid by the patients or by Medicaid and Medicare as a private organization. So then they can't pay their personnel as competitive of a wage as they could possibly make somewhere else. So sometimes community mental health boards will try to fill that gap and pay. And then by doing that, that will also reduce those, Lori, those wait lists. Um, I saw a question from the Weisses. Yes. Why are we doing this on the township level? And um, I can speak for Vernon that uh, when I first heard about this, I was gung ho and I wanted to do this for entire Lake County because when I did my research, I discovered there are no other 708 boards in Lake County. But um, I was advised, and this goes back to the beauty of the 708 board being so hyper local. Um, if there were a countywide community mental health board, funds would probably more than likely not make it to Vernon Township. That doesn't mean we don't have a need or we don't have people on waiting lists, but they're going to go to more impoverished areas. So, um, and the other thing that's nice about the township level 
is that we're not relying on money being funneled through a county, a state, or the federal government, because anyone who's in an elected office knows how um, money can be stalled or withheld. So this money is directly into the township 708 board funding. So I hope that answers your question. And we'll talk more about the funding. We have some slides yeah. a little further up. I don't want to. Yeah, we will answer yeah, it. Uh, yeah, it's let's uh, take our questions at the end. Okay. 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 So what's the process? So the first thing is to get the referendum on the ballot, which it is. And obviously our goal is to get it passed. And then we said that, you know, it's going to, the township appoints the members. They do all these different things. Um, we've somewhat discussed this already. So for the sake of time, I'm going to keep going here. And then Joanne, if you want to talk okay. about this particular part. So uh, this is explaining how they're normally funded. So the statute read, and the statute was established in the 60s, and it was read that uh, the levy would be kept at 0.15% of the EAV of your property value. Um, Vernon Township Board, um, because we were relying on them to pass a resolution, did not want to have that high of a percentage, even though most 708 boards never get near to that amount, but they were very leery. So we actually had uh, Senator Adrian Johnson and Representative Dan Didick do some magic in April in Springfield and um, rewrote that statute so that you can have a ballot question using an amount up anywhere up to 0.15%. So Vernon opted to do it at 0.037% in order to get more funding, they would have to have another referendum. So this is very appealing to anti-tax people that I've talked to because they know exactly what this is going to cost them. And that's the most it'll cost, it might come in less. And at that rate, the levy will bring in um, close to 1.5 million. And it's a cost of approximately $50 a year for the average priced home in Vernon Township. Hanover Township that's been around for a long time, um, it, the cost is between $25 and $50 per year. Um, but once again, back to that needs survey that if the referendum passes or when the referendum passes, um, they'll do a needs survey to conduct and deter will be conducted to determine the amount that will be actually levied. So just to recap for Vernon Township, the median value of a home in Vernon Township is 410,000. The EAV is one third of the market price. So that's 137,000. So on a medium valued home with a levy of 0.037, it would be $50 a year or $4 a month, $4 and 16 cents a month. Lori, did you want me to continue with no, this? No, I'll, I'll, I was trying to remember at what point I was jumping back in. We talked about <laughs> this, but I don't usually tag team, so I apologize if there's a little gap here. There's a lot of statistics talking about the need for mental health care in particular. I, it's in the news all the time nowadays. Um, as I mentioned before, to get a therapist, particularly for kids under 18, it's it's it, there's a long wait. Even before the pandemic, only one out of four people who needed help were getting it. And then with the pandemic, young kids in particular, 18 to 24, it's reported that 25% of them have struggled with suicide ideation since COVID-19. I know some of the statistics always, you know, for mental health particularly really strike home. When my son was diagnosed with schizophrenia, I looked up information about it because I really didn't know anything. And I was amazed to find out that one in 100 people, this statistically will develop schizophrenia. And for young men, that's typically between the ages of 18 and 25. 
So when I thought about that, and I'm thinking of my son's high school class, he graduated in a class of 800, and yet, you know, you never hear about it. So stigma has a lot to do with it as well, but it doesn't help when you're actively trying to seek help and you can't see someone, particularly if you have a substance use disorder. When you're willing to see somebody, you need to see them. The number of ER visits, we had met in Wheeling Township with all the local police and fire chiefs, so including in Buffalo Grove, um, which is shared by the two of us. And they said that, you know, it's striking how many calls they have for mental health crisis and substance use crisis. And um, yeah, I mean, th these are things that mental health boards can help with. And, and we all know that, well, I, I shouldn't say we all know. And, and the people with the people that I work with, one of the things we really struggle to, to get out there is the fact that somebody with a mental illness is far more likely to be hurt by someone else than to injure anyone else. Um, mm -hmm. and, and yet we still have mass shootings to deal with. And we can all remember last December in Buffalo Grove where we had our first police shooting. It was an officer involved shooting with a young man in his 20s who was mentally ill and was firing weapons and walking into a neighborhood of homes. And um, the police got allowed him to get to within 15 feet of them, which is much lower. It's supposed to be the standard is 50 feet when you shoot. And um, I wonder too about how much you see down here about first responders and dispatchers. Um, of course, I felt terrible for the young man and his family, but I also feel, feel really awful for our two officers that were involved in that shooting. So um, it, 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 it's hard to deal with for the rest of your life. Yeah. And just the, the number of calls that they deal with and just the stress in general of that job. It's no wonder that the rates of um, PTSD are that high. And substance use, U.S. set a new record, over 100,000 overdose deaths. And then, of course, what every, a lot of people talk about are um, deaths from opioids. O overdose deaths in 30 were up 33 percent in, in Illinois, but and also up almost 20 percent in Lake County. And a lot of this, when people hear this, they're thinking about opioids, which are on the in the news quite a lot. But yet, alcohol deaths and injuries related to alcohol far exceed any of the deaths from opioids. Okay, developmental disabilities. I'm not gonna go through all the different statistics. Um, I have a friend whose daughter has a developmental disability and I'm sure this is the same in Vernon Township as it is in ours. Services and schools are great. I know you have an excellent high school there. Everyone, everyone knows Stevenson High School. And so the problems usually arise when kids get out of high school. So they're able to stay in high school until they're 22. Um, and after that, then they're on a list to get services. It's called a PUNS list. It's a prioritization, something, something, something. Mm -hmm. um, for my friend, his daughter, it took eight years to get off this list. And she's now receiving services from Clearbrook, which is an excellent organization. So I don't mean any any um, bad remarks to them. They, I give them kudos for everything they do. But yet now that she's getting services from Clearbrooks, there still aren't very many services that they can provide her because she's a higher level functioning and the way that the funds are allocated, it, she's just not eligible for many services. And, and that's just a, a sad fact that here in Illinois, I've seen different numbers depending on which year you're looking at, but it's somewhere between 42 and 47 for the state of Illinois and how we rank nationally for being able to provide services. Mm -hmm. 
And there's a lot of costs. I, I, you can, I'm, I'm assuming if you hear, most of you would agree with this, that the cost of doing nothing is extremely high. Cook County Jail is the single largest service provider for mental health services in the state. You know, and that to me is just shameful. And it's in the top three for the country. And the oh. other two are also jails. I think, I, I don't yeah. know which ones, but I think one is in New York City, but yeah. Yeah, it breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. So now these people are in jail, which obviously is not free either. It's very expensive to keep someone in jail. And then they're also not productive citizens. Whereas if we can provide people treatment earlier, you know, maybe we can reverse the, reverse what's happening. So Lori has shared her story about her son, but I also have a story to share, um, you know, aside from the officer involved shooting, which was, um, very difficult for a lot of us in Buffalo Grove to process. But I had a daughter who suffered from um, depression and anxiety when she was a junior in college at University of Illinois. And um, there's nothing worse than getting a phone call at midnight saying that somebody wants to kill themselves and you're several hours away. So um, I know we have insurance, but the insurance couldn't tell me how much they'd pay for the um, the program that she was going to enter into. And I had a lot of questions and none of her providers can talk to you. <laughs> so one of the things that someone has suggested to me is um, that we have a parent support group created, which would not cost a lot of money, but it might need some in the beginning to get it going. So. Um, that's my story, and Lori has shared her story. Um, but I think everybody, if you were to be honest with yourself, everyone knows somebody affected by one of these three um, um, conditions. So um, it's 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 very common. So here's the specific language that will appear on the ballot. Um, I don't have to read it to you because it's been, you can look it up later if you want, but, um, and there is, just so you know, there is some supplemental language, um, lawyers, what can I say? <laughs> so there's two statements below the question that further explain um, what this referendum question is, but this is really the meat of what's going to be on your ballot. So as I said before, where it was $4 a month, if you think about that, it's a latte. <laughs> and it, when you add it all together, we can generate enough funds to have, provide a, a granting service that would expand and provide stable funding for Vernon Township residents. And it would be providing new services not just the same old services, looking for new things to do in Vernon Township. So I really like this point that's in red here. One dollar invested in scaling up treatment for depression and anxiety rewards taxpayers with refer return of four dollars in better health and ability to work. So this goes back to our very first slide, one of our first slides about how much does do these conditions cost? society, well, if you put a dollar in, so if we're putting $50 in a year, you can multiply that <laughs> by four and you're getting $200 in return. I don't know how much we wanna go through all yeah. the statistics. I don't think we need to go through, you guys can look at it later at your leisure. Um, it Certainly, if anybody has questions, I'll click through some of these. Um, yeah, you know, because this is for the public, so uh, they may want to know more information. Okay. I mean, yeah. Okay. Well, All right, Joy. I'll let you keep uh, going. Here we go. So you can see with the first point of that research has told us that every dollar spent on substance abuse saves $4 in healthcare costs and $7 in law enforcement and other criminal justice costs, which 
that's a big pull on your tax levy for public safety every year. So if we can lower that cost, that would be terrific. Um, there's statistically, I can tell you that in Buffalo Grove, when we started with a social worker in our police department, we had her part-time for one year and then bumped her up full-time in the second year because we could prove statistically that repeat calls for domestic violence in particular decreased by 50% in our village by having a social worker. Not every police department has a social worker. And I've been told that we could use a second social worker. There's enough money or there's enough uh, need that, to justify it. So, the, yeah, when we met with the police chiefs and the fire chiefs, the two big things that they said that they would like to have would be social workers. So even the ones that had social workers needed more and then some type of mental health crisis center. And a mental health crisis center, the, there's a few things that it would do for the police. One, they could drop people off there without having to fill out all the paperwork. Um, two, it gives them an option between jails and hospitals, which right now, those are their only two options. If someone's having either a mental health crisis or substance use, they can either take them to jail or they can take them to a hospital if they need to be removed from the situation they're in. So a mental health crisis center Somebody could be there a few hours, depending on the facility and how, how well funded they are. And in some places they can be there for a few days. And it, it, they are staffed. Uh, sometimes, you know, a person just needs to, someplace they can chill out and relax and get out of the situation that they're in. Sometimes they need to be talked into going to a hospital for further treatment, but it gives the police that extra option. Yeah, because the police hate to criminalize mental health. And sometimes that's what they're forced to do. If a family isn't helping an individual or an individual is over age 18, if the family doesn't believe they're in this situation, they'll just continue to ignore it. And I've learned that sometimes police actually charge somebody with a minor crime, like disturbing the peace or something, just to get them in front of a judge who will force them into mental health care. Um, so here, this is going back about um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And you can see in the very first bullet point that every dollar invested in that area saves $17 in health and societal costs. Um, we have over 70,000 kids under the age of 18 who are at risk of developmental delays um, that might set them back when they can start school. But of that 70,000, just close to 34,000 are actually receiving early intervention services. So um, that, that's um, kind of a profound statement. Um, and then for persons with severe disabilities, um, employees return an average monthly net benefit to taxpayers of $251 or an annual net benefit of about $3,000 for every supported employee. And that generates a benefit cost ratio of $1.46 for every dollar spent. So stigma is a big issue um, associated with mental illness. I think, um, Younger people in society, they're getting better. Um, I told you about my daughter and when we told her we were pulling her out of school, she didn't speak to us for a few days. We had to wait for our screening appointment. And then we had to wait a couple more days to, for her to actually start the program. But a couple days after she started, I started getting phone calls about a blog she wrote and there were 6,000 likes in one day. And she took it upon herself to say, I have mental illness and I want to end the stigma. But she's very unusual. Um, and I can tell you, conversely, um, I had a parent with mental illness and there was a huge stigma there. And I could never successfully get her treatment until she had dementia. <laughs> and she didn't know what medicine she was getting. So that's pretty sad. And I also have heard a lot about um, 
how Medicare doesn't offer a robust network of professionals. And I can go back to my parents where I had her seen a psychiatrist. And after two visits, she was dropped because she was on Medicare. And the, um, there's also a 190 day lifetime limit on inpatient care. So Which I can't even imagine. I just can't imagine. Even for the people that I know that are doing well, it's not that unusual to go back in the hospital because medications need to be adjusted. You know, you, you have a change in life circumstances or sometimes just after a period of time, you need to adjust your medication. And right. often it's better to do that in a hospital than on your own at home. So to have a 190 day lifetime limit, I just can't imagine. Yeah, it's terrible. So um, you may have read, I know that there's, an ex there's a shortage of nurses and physicians right now that's projected to get even worse. Um, I don't know about this first statistic where they say that the shortage of mental health professionals will continue through 2025. Um, that to me seems pretty close, but seems optimistic. Um, yeah. yeah, very optimistic. So, yeah, and and then the second point that would be, you know, the stigma is the biggest um, barrier in my opinion. But people who are on a fixed income, they can't afford the cost or what they think the cost would be. That would go back to what I was telling you when my daughter was going into a program. And my credit card was getting charged $5,000 every Friday. And my insurance company couldn't tell me what they were going to reimburse. It was, it's even though um, coverage, insurance coverage for mental illness is supposed to be equal to <laughs> health insurance. It's not. It's treated completely differently. And it's very scary when you have to go into this because it's expensive. So, um, you know. I don't know if there'd be a way to offer grants to people or funding for people that can't afford it, but that'll all come up when they do their survey. So these are some things that have happened in other communities that have 708 boards. Um, they do the screenings for behavioral risk, the social workers like we talked to, expansion of crisis intervention training. Um, and uh, something I learned about, um, I was presenting to the Vernon Hills and Libertyville High Schools. And uh, they have a big team of 50 people put together of educators, um, police, fire, government officials, community members. And it was in response to the uh, Highland Park shooting. And so the woman that set up the counseling uh, for the Highland Park shooting that went, she provided counseling for six days at Highland Park Hospital or Highland Park High School. And it wasn't just her. She had a network of people and it ended up with 20 people the first day, 60 people the next day. But they're working on creating a, um, a plan and a task force and creating a 501c3 that will respond to mass casualty incidents. So because a school shooting is completely different than what happened in Highland Park because you can't do your, um, your grief counseling in the school if there's been a shooting there. So this is just, there's so many ideas out there right now. Um, yeah, and so if you want more information, feel free to go to our Facebook page um, oh. and like it and share it. And then we do have- um, I just realized, Joanne, the website is incorrect. Yes. It's um, advocateforseven08.org. I'll put it in the oh, chat. Okay. So before we send this to uh, Rosemary to, to distribute, let's make that correction. Yeah, I will. Okay. And you can also email me too. <laughs> I know it well. I, I spend a fair amount of time trying to update it. Um, yes, Lori works really hard on that website. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, we really appreciate your time. Um, and then let's go through these questions. We'll start with that. 
here we go. Well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna speak. Uh, the reason that I was interested in this was once I realized it wasn't creating new services, but asking to create a taxing body that would provide a reliable stream of income to, for the most part, existing organizations that already provide services in the three areas of mental health, substance abuse, and uh, developmental disabilities, it just struck me as so important because we hear from uh, providers all the time that they can't make plans, they don't know how much money they'll get from the state, and the needs of society, in my opinion, should not rely on the, the kindness of good-hearted people. It should be built into the structure of government, in my opinion. So uh, that's what appealed to me about this. So uh, let's, uh, are we done with this? Shall we stop the share? Is that- Oh, uh, yes, we'll sure, thank you. Everybody? And uh, we have some questions and uh, let's see. Uh, I think uh, Martha had a question. And yes. everybody can okay. unmute. So, yeah, what qualifications would township board members look for when appointing, appointing the 708 boards? You know, unfortunately, that's something we don't have any control over. I can tell you what they've done in other areas. So ideally, uh, one of the members is going to be on the township board. So that way there's some um, continuum between what the board would like to see and what this mental health board is doing. Uh, and then they should have expertise in some one of these areas. Um, they should, you know, maybe have somebody that knows about finances because they are dealing with a lot of money. But that's what they've done in, in other areas. Other areas, they've actually had an application that they posted online for people to apply. There, there's a couple of requirements. They have to be a resident of the township and they cannot uh, be a part of an organization that's going to be asking for funding, which makes sense. Does that answer your question? Yes, I, that's what I was wondering if there would be people that had a, their own agenda when they were trying to get on this board because they have. Well, you know, I think a lot of us join committees because we have a particular goal in mind. But um, no, I mean, in terms of the funding to to the right, they they are yeah yeah that's one of the requirements. They can't have a direct conflict of interest. Okay. They can't, they can't receive funds from the 708 board and be on the 708 board. Um, somebody um, asked if these programs extend. Well, let's, to uh, let's hold up because Barbara oh. is on the phone right now and that was her question. So let's, oh, okay. wait, let's wait till she comes back for that. Okay. Um, okay. And, uh, but Martha and Jeff, uh, do you see this long uh, question, Joanne, for you? It's, yes. it's, they asked, did, did Buffalo Grove participate in the SFY 22 Community Law Enforcement and Other First Responder Partnership for Deflection and Substance Use Disorder Treatment Act, <laughs> Comprehensive wow. Community Law Enforcement and Other First Responder Response to Drugs Program. I heard about it in a meeting in Fox River Grove. It sounded impressive. The title is certainly impressive <laughs> and, and very economical. So I don't know. Explain real quickly. I happened to be at a board meeting in Fox River Grove in January, and the police chief presented this uh, grant program, and it would give the uh, police and first responders the ability to make direct referrals to appropriate uh, agencies in the case of uh, drug overdoses and other situations involving uh, possible mental health. And the cost of it, it was a grant funded program run through the state, and the cost for the village to enroll was 5,000 bucks for the year. So the board absolutely jumped on it and it was uh, quickly approved. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't bring it back to somebody's attention in Buffalo Grove, but it was uh, it was a really cool thing. Well, you are now. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I just read that the grant uh, expired or the participation oh. expired in August. Okay. So, um, I don't know specifically with this verbiage if we participate in this, but I do know that um, in Illinois, 
it's required that one police officer on every shift be trained in uh, mental illness. And in Buffalo Grove, every single one of our officers is trained. So we set the bar very high. Our police chief, when he was uh, president of International Chiefs of Police and Illinois State Police, uh, Chiefs of Police, one of his top three priorities was mental health. And that was for officers and for residents. So um, I can tell you when we had our officer involved shooting, the first recommendation was that those two officers, they go home for two days for 48 hours and rest and no questioning, nothing. They can come back and, and it's, it's been proven that that really helps with long-term PTSD from an event like that. But I will, I will find out for, and let you guys know. I'll shoot you an email about this. Okay, and Barbara's back, Thank so you, we can answer her question now about uh, what what kind of uh, let's see how did oh does it oh does the program extend to other conditions? So this um, community mental health boards deal with those three things only: mental health, substance use, developmental, and intellectual disabilities. And the money has to be spent on one of those three things. So the, you know the good news is. It can't be spent on other things. So it can't take in the money and then decide, you know, our roads need repaired or something. Um, but and yeah, good or for good or bad, that's what it covers. And uh, what uh, what what are you doing to uh, publicize this to the community uh, of Vernon Hills? Well, it's it's really been a complicated campaign, I have to be honest. <laughs> um, we don't have a lot of money. <laughs> so um, we've been relying a lot on social media. Um, we do have yard signs that are gonna go up and um, we've had a fairly positive response to when we put a call out for people who want yard signs. Um, we've investigated texting and decided that that's not a good idea because um, people don't like to open a text from someone they don't know. So um, we did, we decided against that. Um, so we've been going to the farmer's market in Buffalo Grove. And we're going um, to be trying to go to the doors. We have a palm card and we're going to try to hit every door of someone who has voted in the general election in the last two times. So um, we've got a lot of cars. We have a lot of walking. If anybody's a walker <laughs> and they want to get some exercise, I have a we're, really easy way for you to do it. <laughs> yeah. We're looking for places to present always. Joanne's presented at the high schools, but PTAs, PTOs, any place of faith churches, synagogues, I mean, you name it. Yeah, I mean, we're uh, we're looking for all kinds of ways to get the word out there. To, to, you have to, as you would well appreciate, you have to go with where you have volunteers to do things, where you have the resources. Um, you know, the, so the more people we have, the, the easier it gets to, to spread the message. There was a great article in the Daily Herald We've been reaching out to all the newspapers. Um, we have also are going to be doing letters to the editor. So if anybody wants to help write letters to the editor, that would be great. Mm -hmm. okay. I just saw another question pop up, mm -hmm. if there's any opposition. Um, so I can answer for Vernon Township at this time, no. Um, I did try to meet with every different political party that's out there um, and got uh, a lot of support from some people. I was gonna stop, I the, it's being I was gonna recorded. stop the recording. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that's all right, that's all right. we can stop it. Or, but Sharon had one more question uh, in the chat. Uh, how successful are these boards in actually satisfying the identified needs? For example, since there is already a shortage of social workers, how and where are these boards expected to hire someone? 
you know, that's a good question. So some of the things that they can do are, um, you know, provide incentives for people to stay, like I said, to, to work in it and uh, for a social worker uh, in an area that's not as paid as high. So if you're working in Medicare or Medicaid, their pay is lower so they can provide incentives for that. Um, obviously you can't create people out of nothing, but there's actually some, been some new state legislation that may, may help with that. Um, but, um, but they, I, I think they've been fairly successful actually. I mean, they've, they have filled gaps. They have, they have found social workers in other places. I know Bloomingdale and Milton both had, are the two most recent in kind of our area, sub suburbs of Chicago, and they hired social workers for the, their police departments. Mm -hmm. uh, they were able to provide um, respite care for parents of children with developmental and intellectual disabilities, particularly during COVID. So, I mean, they have been able to provide some very specific services that, that were helpful and places, again, those gaps where things, these services didn't exist and they were needed. Well, and if you have a steady stream of money that is supporting, let's say we have Omni, for example, which is, you know, yes. provides youth services and, and family services. So if Omni knows that they can count on how much, what is, you know, whatever the grant might be a year, say, say $50,000 a year, to to hire a social worker and this is going on all over illinois that there are reliable sources of funding then more people are going to say oh uh, maybe i will go into social work because i uh, there are more jobs out there that are that are steady and reliable that are not yes. grant based year to year that we have to spend half of our year writing a grant to get the money to pay for the job of which i'm spending half the time writing a grant i mean and Absolutely. so yeah. Over time, more people will feel that this is a, an area of work that they would like to, uh, and that, that is reliable enough and steady enough that they want to go into it. I don't know, uh, Lori, if you've heard of this, but somebody mentioned to me uh, where you could set up a scholarship fund. And so somebody goes into this, into one of these three fields, and then comes back and agrees to work for X number of years. Um, obviously it wouldn't be a full scholarship or anything because we're not generating that much money, but, um, just to incentivize people to work in these areas and then to come back and work in the local area that helped them in, in college. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. There's a lot of different things they can do. Um, so, you know, if your police department has a su su sufficient number of social workers, then that's not going to come up in the survey as a high need. You know, perhaps what's needed is really helping people with disabilities to get jobs. I was at a, a picnic for NAMI, again, the Association for Mental Illness. And when I asked the people there, you know, if they, what kind of things do they, would they like to have? And support getting jobs was one of their number one things. And so it's not just people with developmental disabilities that are looking to have jobs. And some of it is for the money, but also just to have some structure in their lives. You know, the folks with mental illness are also having a hard time getting jobs, depending on how severe their illness is. So there's such a wide array of needs out there. There really are, you know, everything from, you know, helping with, with the kids to elderly. I mean, you name it. I know um, just getting to places can be difficult. I mean, their Wheeling Township has a bus, but there's a lot of limitations on where they can take you. Um, we have a local agency here called Shelter Inc. that helps teenagers, uh, those different different age groups with uh, with homes. And so what they do is to give the kids um, money for Uber rides. That's how they get around, you know. So maybe the agency helps with things like that. It could be any number of things, really. It's hard to say ahead of time what those needs are going to be determined be determined to be. I know um, in conversation recently with Bruce Johnson, who's the CEO of NACASA, 
um, he used to have an office in Vernon Township and lost his lease. And so they have a Round Lake office and they have a Highland Park office. And he'd love to see some funding to relocate again back into this more south central part of Lake County. Um, another thing I heard about was um, there's a concept, um, it's called a living room and where police can take um, a family that maybe there's someone who's having a mental um, illness issue and instead of taking them to the hospital or to um, court, they can go there and calm down and have a nice conversation. But the closest one I was told is in Waukegan. So um, it's, you know, it would be really nice to have one down here. So, and the other thing is I've had a lot of people um, who are my age and they have kids who are in their late twenties hitting 30 with developmental disabilities. And the kids actually have a job, but like Lori was talking about, they can't get there. And so, and, and they're fearful to leave them. So one of the two parents ends up sacrificing their career and their income so that their adult child can get to have structure in their life. Uh, this is the actual, uh... I've posted here the actual referendum. And so what this means here, this part one, is that currently, to correct me if I'm wrong, Vernon Township currently raises uh, 3.8 million as it is now. And some of that as some of those, some of that money is spent on, on general assistance and some services, I'm sure. Uh, and so if this proposition is approved, it would raise <laughs> The extendable, I, I assume that's the most, would be five uh, five point three million, and so I subtracted that, and it comes comes to about one and a half million dollars extra exactly. that yeah, they yeah. would have uh, to spend on whatever needs the board decides. Mm -hmm. Now the board is not paid, right? It's a volunteer board. They're volunteer. 